Do that. And there. Let me sneak through you just for one sec to throw that in and see what kind of angle I'm getting there. That just means I have That's exactly. Try that. In there. Yeah. Standing room only. Now's your chance. If you've got, if there's seats available, go grab them. We can pretend it's Southwest Airlines for a minute. I want to be heckled. This is great. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm one of the booksellers here. I'm pleased you're joining us to celebrate this truly astonishing book, Prince Icon. Tonight we are joined by Steve Park, Greg Hel Helgeson, Alan Beaulieu, St. Paul Peterson, and Jimmy Steinfeld who will talk about their experiences with musical royalty. Then there should be time at the end of the program for audience questions, possibly. After the Q&A, please allow us to move to the signing counter, which was that glass display case you passed on your way into the store. You can line up there, say hello, get a signed copy of the book. If you buy a book here this evening, you are not only supporting these authors, but also a locally owned independent bookstore, and we cannot thank you enough. Tonight, let us party like it is 1999, by which I mean a time when cell phones did not exist. <laughs> yeah, so let's go ahead and turn off those cell phones. Here we go. Steve Park is an award-winning photographer and the author of Picture and Prince, which was published by Hachette in 2017. He was Prince's in-house art director for over a decade at Chase Park. <laughs> Overseeing numerous creative projects from the late 1980s to the early 2000s. He currently works as the in-house photographer and photo editor for the quarterly print magazine Enchanted Living, which the New York Times described as what would happen if Martha Stewart Living and Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen had a magazine baby. <laughs> Greg Helgeson has a BA in photojournalism from the He began his, photo, his photography career for the past 40 plus years, working primarily in the music arts area, worked as a photographer for alternative <coughs> publications in Minneapolis, and in images have been featured in world renowned publications such as the Rolling Stone, New York Times, Boston Globe. The Washington Post, the LA Times, and our very own Star Tribune. Yeah. Yeah. Alan Boya. Yeah. You got yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Up. That's nice. Yeah, that's Alan's seat if you want. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> he worked with Prince from the late 1970s into the early 80s, capturing the musician's progression from rising star to ultimate purple stardom. Always at Prince's side with camera in hand, Belia helped Prince carry forward his vision with legendary album cover images and promotional photos during the groundbreaking <laughs> controversy in 1999 era, while also capturing live performances on tour with Prince. You have a star in the audience. Jelly Bean Chance is right. Uh, <laughs> we have room for one more chair, maybe. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jimmy Steinfeld has taken a lot of a lot of photographs. Some of them are quite good. St. Paul Peterson is the youngest member of the Peterson family. Notice the first family of music in Minnesota. Prince discovered Paul, aka St. Paul, at the age of 17, and listed him as a keyboard player in the time for the movie Pur Purple Rain, which many of you have heard of. St. Paul recently released Break on Free on Leopard Re Records out of Germany and has been touring with St. Paul and the Minneapolis Funk All-Stars worldwide. Yeah. He has a podcast called Music on the Run that focuses on how traveling artists survive physically, mentally, and with their relationships whilst at home, uh, away from home. St. Paul is the current president of the Rotary Club of the Dyna. Yeah. Which I mentioned solely because it's so goddamn rock and roll. <laughs> I like a rock and roll. Allow me to introduce our guests, Steve Park, Greg Helgeson, Alan Bollier, St. Paul Peterson, and Jenny Steinfeld. And yeah. hey, don't forget Jeff. That's cool. Jelly Beans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jelly Beans here, my big bro. Yeah. First of all, welcome and thank you for coming to this. This is a great turnout for these guys. They deserve it. How about this book? Give it up. Steve Burke added that, so Steve Burke is the one for that. Yeah. Well, pick up, you got a mic over there? Yeah, yeah. What did you say? Uh, Steve Burke is the one who created this book. Yeah. So, why, why don't we lead right into that? Steve, how did this book come to be? It's more of a collaboration than it is just individual books, obviously, because we got for the photographers right here. Tell me a little bit about how you got this book together, the concept, the whole thing. Well, I, it was not just me, um, but I got contacted by my agents in the UK who've done books like this on Bowie, uh, Bowie David Bowie icon, uh, Roll, Rolling Stones icons. Um, so they had an idea to Hey, this. I got on the cover of Rolling Stones. That's right. In That's Germany. Right. <laughs> you were. I'm on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, cover of Rolling Stones. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so no, yeah. anyways, basically what happened was Take the we decided to do this um, and involve as many photographers as we could. Now, one of the problems we ran into, and the reason it took so long to come out, because I know they initially were like, hey, can we just use some of your images for the cover like we did with the David Bowie and have these little small photos uh, going together? And um, I said, sure. And it sat on Amazon for, I think, two years, something like that. And, um, and I was like, oh no, what has happened? Because we had all these people that we wanted to contact. And um, it, it, the problem was is that everybody had different rights usages for these images. And some of them didn't know what their rights usages were. So uh, yeah, so that became a bit of a problem. And so for example, Jeff Katz, whose work I love, unfortunately, he couldn't get it because people ask me that why he isn't in America. It's because he already has a deal, uh, I assume, with the estate. So he couldn't do this particular project. Um, and some other people probably have ran into similar issues. Uh, but we got a load of great people. Um, part of my job was to contact people, um, talk to them about it, and kind of convince them, like, hey, this is going to be a fabulous project, which I think it has turned out to be amazing. Um, yeah, because I honestly, when I open it, I'm just like, oh my god, this looks so good. And I mean, I'd seen the proofs as we went, but seeing it as a, a total book, seeing the print quality, seeing the narratives from everybody and reading those, what just blew my mind. And uh, seeing Alan's work huge, um, like I love your book that you did, but seeing it at that scale, that's what's amazing to me. And, and I was very fortunate that I got to look through some of this stuff early on and I'm just like, oh my God, that was on the ceiling of my bedroom when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I'm not kidding, it's like the thumbtacks had to fall out of the ceiling before the poster come down. Right, exactly, but, uh, yeah, yeah. But I'm honored, I'm honored. And, uh, you know, Steve's a great photographer, and, you know, um, it's strange how, how the world works, because I met Benedict, Benedict Anderson first, and uh, she hired me for their YWCA. <laughs> there, was a, there wasn't a YMCA, it was YWCA, and they did a Shades of Blackness fashion extravaganza, and she hired me to do the posters. Prince saw the poster, called me right away said, uh, come and work for me. And, of course, he doesn't sing in false <laughs> he goes, He goes, this is Prince. And then I go, I know who you are. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know what he sounds like. So, um, you know, he says, "Well, how much do you charge an hour?" And I go, "I have no idea. <laughs> what do I charge an hour?" <laughs> so now he said, "Well, we'll book you for three days." I said, "Okay." So we did the uh, the star photo was our first, <laughs> and. Uh, Although we didn't get any M covers in there, um, kind of sad about that. But uh, I don't know. I didn't get to pick the photos. So yeah, tell tell them which uh, album covers that you did. Yeah, I did Dirty Mind, Controversy, 1999. I did the time. Uh, which the time? Both, both the time cool, the cool. And I, I didn't do I didn't do Ice Cream <laughs> Castle. I was gonna. I was supposed to. We talked about it. Um, I didn't. I couldn't in my mind figure out how to do ice cream castles, um, but um, uh, but you know when you're fired when you're freelance because uh, you just don't get called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Al, you had a hell of a run with Prince Al. Oh, so yeah, no, I you did the six. I did the time. I did. Yeah, yeah. 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 he was very He, he said to me at one point, he said, you know, you're getting more famous than me. And I go, I'll never get more famous than you. <laughs> he got mad at me. He goes, you know, you need to change the name or something. <laughs> I said, well, you know, it's not going to last. I mean, it's just right now. You feel kind of weird. But but anyway, so then, yeah, he fired me like the next day. Because <laughs> there was one in fire calls and one in my phone number. And he said, I'm not going to give it to, to them. So, uh, you're my photographer. So, yeah, yeah, never call me again. Just a little protective. <laughs> yeah, just a little. You know, it's very, a lot of times when people ask me questions, when I'm on the other end of this uh, microphone, we, first of all, we all have similar lives. You know, we, we, we were analog once upon a time, right? Now we're digital. Yeah. You were in the studio or you're live. I mean, there's so many different things that are so parallel with the things that we do between photographers and musicians. The question I always get asked is, how did you get the call? And Al, you already answered that. Greg, will you answer the call? Uh, tell us how you got the call from Prince and, and uh, how did you start working with him? Take the mic. Uh, essentially, just, <laughs> in, my, in my case, it was freelance. I got assigned to go uh, cover him at uh, the Capri Theater. And that was uh, the first time I had seen him. I, I had mentioned the notes in the beginning of the book that I had no idea really who he was. There was a buzz around him. I didn't know him. either. And it, that's good to hear. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we did that during the uh, Minneapolis Black Botanical. And we were in a van, a white van, and all these girls were pounding on the window. <laughs> and I go, this little kid's got like kids pounding on the window? But he did. He just—he was like, it was unbelievable. I got scared. Yeah. I'm going. They're going to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> so, Greg, you, you were you were a freelancer, yeah. right? And you got the call to go to the Capri, and uh, if I read it correctly, you, there was a lot of family members around at that. Yeah, I sat time. down at the end of a roll and just picked a spot, uh, like I was going to a movie because this place was like a, well, it was an old uh, theater. It was. So I sat there I and saw and, two sir with love. You saw it. That's yeah. <laughs> when it first came up. That's 1967. Yeah. It's well. <laughs> so, my first girlfriend and I went to the Capri. She used to I didn't know the. By that time, there wasn't a, the, a screen anymore. I think. Yeah, there is now. So, but, uh, his family ended up parking. Eat that mic there. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, he. he uh, I just parked myself from, for a good spot because I wanted to shoot from, the, from kind of an angle. and. Uh, and as I sat there, his family sat down next to me. I didn't know where we were. And one of them tapped me on the shoulder, like I mentioned, and just said, that's my brother out there. Wow. And uh, so we, I would give him little looks once in a while, because as the concert progressed, I was stunned. I couldn't believe what I was seeing and hearing, because I didn't know really who he was. The Warner Brothers uh, record reps were there that night. Uh, and he was per pretty much, as far as I know, playing to, the, to his family and friends, that kind of thing. But after that, I certainly knew. I mean, it was, it was uh, Well, yeah, you know right away. Yeah, you, you know you were not dealing with someone. Yeah, you, you don't even have to be in the same room, you know. 
that uh, he's got something that nobody else has. Yeah, his presence and stuff. And the rest of the band, too. It's vanity, too. It's like, you know, he's so pretty. Oh. <laughs> Jimmy, do me a favor. Grab the mic. And Tell me a little bit about your background and how you got the call from Prince, and then we'll get into the artistic things in a minute here. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, uh, I too uh, was then and am now a freelance photographer, so uh, I didn't get a call from Prince. That would have been pretty cool. Uh, but uh, obviously there was a, a tremendous buzz. Uh, the year that I photographed him was 1983. That's the first time I photographed Prince. And uh, that was on 8383. Mm -hmm. And it was at First Avenue Nightclub. And uh, it was a fundraiser for the yeah. Royce Holton. I was there. Uh, very good, yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> thanks for not blocking my uh, shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, here we go. <laughs> so I, uh, I positioned myself in the middle of that large dance yeah. floor in front of the stage. And I don't think I really had even any credentials to be there. I, this was in the days where you could just show up at a venue. And now you can only shoot three shows. There you go. So I was able to shoot, I think, the whole show. But what's really interesting in retrospect, I don't know if all of you or among you know this, but that particular show where I was and Al was somewhere near me, apparently, uh, that show was recorded uh, professionally with the uh, uh, the record plant. Uh, the truck, the truck out. was out in the street with the lines going into First Avenue. David Z and Susan. And David Z, the great record producer, and Susan Rogers right, yep. were in the sound truck recording that entire evening. And whenever you hear Purple Rain, the song, it's that show because it was a live recording. Now they did some adjustment, you know, to mix it and, but, so wherever I go around the world and hear that song, I was there the night it was I was there, started. being you were there, we had to be there. <laughs> <laughs> it was our job to be there. Yeah, Prince and, Prince and Morris were playing that night. I wouldn't be surprised. So I, I just, uh, you know, the back room is like really little with Prince Avenue. So I just left. So I'll wrap up my thought about yeah. that. that. So, uh, I was supposed was, to meet Wendy then. I never did. So I uh, got the pictures back from the lab in the days when you got pictures back from a lab, right? Before right. digital. And they were darn good. And I'd only been taking photos for as a music photographer for about a year. And I'd only been doing any photography for a few years. Well, anyway, the pictures were good. So um, I thought, well, what, how, what do I do with these? And about a week later, I'm at Rudolph's restaurant. We all remember Rudolph's. I miss Rudolph's. Yeah, I miss that Rudolph's too. And it was in the afternoon. It was sort of a time when nobody's there. I went there for lunch. Uh, there was nobody in any of the rooms. They sat me next to Prince and Apollonia. Wow. I was there with a buddy of mine. They sat us, I mean, they could have put us in another room. They sat us right next. So I'm going like, oh my god. There he is, right next to me, not on the stage. Um, and uh, when he finished his meal, I just said, uh, pardon me, but uh, I photographed you recently. I have some very good pictures, and I'd like to give them to you. And he said, let's see exactly how he said it. Uh, he said, uh, oh, yeah, um, well, you can send them to my management. You know, he's very soft-spoken. And I said, well, I don't know who that is. So I said, well, who, your management? Uh, who are they and how do I do that? I can tell them. They're on the back of all my albums. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's all I said. And That's but I did what he said. Yeah. I contacted his management and uh, kind of the rest is history because I continued to photograph him in concert uh, for the next 14 years. Wow. 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 I want to bring back over to you, Steve. Yeah, he is mad at me. So I know that you're uh, uh, you are you're, you are a music nerd. <laughs> and you have been for your entire life. You went and photographed the Purple Rain tour, did you not? Under the guise of, of being a uh, photographer for your high school class or something like that. You've got to tell these people yeah, yeah. what that is and then get into the fact of how you got to work out at Paisley. So yeah, the first time I photographed him and I 
kind of forgot about it, to be perfectly honest, until more recently. Um, when I was in high school, I worked for my school newspaper, and I just thought, hey, I can call and say I work for a newspaper and get photo passes. So I did a lot of that, and I got to know the security guys at one of our big arena uh, places. And he was coming through, of course, I couldn't get a photo pass for that. Most people probably couldn't get a photo pass for that, unless you were really up there. Um, so I knew the security guys pretty well because I didn't treat them terribly like a lot of the other photographers who I saw there sometimes. You know, I need my pass, I'm supposed to be in there. And I'm just like, whenever guys, you know, I'm cool, whenever I can get in, it's cool. And um, they were asking me, are you shooting the show tonight? And I'm like, no. And then one of them, the biggest guy there too, he's like, do you have your camera with you? I'm like, yes, it's in my car, go get it. I'm like, okay. So I go out and I get it from the car. Because I always parked around back, so it was really easy for me to just go get it. And he ushered me to my seat, which I had paid for. And he said, every time I go past, he would see the security guys. He goes, he's cool, he's cool, he's cool. They get me to my seat, he just goes, just be cool. And I'm like, okay. And so I was shooting up there, and I'd just be like, click, and then put it back down. Click, put it back down. So I, um, one of the shots that I have is in the book, which is that one right there. So that's actually the first photo I actually took of a Prince that was reasonably good. <laughs> and But I never, somebody said, did you ever tell him? I'm like, no, and you know what? I probably shouldn't have, because he probably wondered how I got my camera in, and that might have become an issue. So I just, unfortunately, yeah, forgot about that. But basically, with um, photographing him, um, he just came into my office one day, and he said, hey, have you heard of digital cameras? And I'm like, no. And he said, Jeff Katz just told me there's digital cameras where they don't need film. And I said, really? And he's like, yeah. Have you ever photographed anything? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, okay, let's do something. And that was it. Um, he said, go, go get a camera. We um, rented one from one of the photo places down here. Somebody had one of the early digital cameras, which was a Nikon DCS 460. It was between Nikon and Kodak. Kodak made the digital part. Mm. Um, and that's how it started. And it was always just hey, get your camera, which is funny because we rented it, but it's not my camera, but whatever. Um, that, that was it, that was like our whole, our whole thing, was just get your camera, we're gonna take pictures. And so wait a minute, and I'm gonna interrupt you because this is really a good point for these other guys. That is, you were the, hey, get, get my camera, let's go shoot now. Yeah. You weren't necessarily the studio guy who would be, you did some setups and things like that, correct? Yeah, 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 occasionally, but most of it was pretty much on the fly and under non-ideal circumstances, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And what was that like as, was that intimidating to you? Or was that like, oh, this is just my gig, I'm gonna just go for it. How, what, what were you thinking at this point in time? Honestly, it was, yeah, it was, this is what it is. Um, I'd already been working for him for a while, so I knew how it worked. I already had been about as intimidated as I was ever gonna be, yeah. you know? So it was just one more thing to do. And it was exciting, and it was always, even, even though it was digital, you didn't see it until you brought it out. So it was a little bit like film. So I'm like, please God, let this be all A in focus, B exposed well. Because he was sitting right next to me when I take that big, I mean, it was huge uh, thing that you take out of it, stick it in the computer, no idea how it's gonna come out, and he's right next to me. It's not like I can be like, hey, you go do your thing, I'm gonna delete the ones I don't think are good. You know, he saw everything. And so that, that was the stressy part of it. But um, fortunately, everything worked out pretty well in general terms. And would he be there going, I like this one? I hate this, destroy this. Oh yeah, it was delete immediately. Until he learned, he couldn't get them back. Because <laughs> he, he came and he was like, you know that one shot from yesterday? I said, oh no, he goes, can you get that back? I'm like, no. So then, so like at the beginning of the, of the photos I have of him, there's very few of the early ones. And as we went on, he would let me keep more and more and more. I mean, he still approved them, like, you know, but he would let me keep a greater variety, realizing that if we kept deleting them, he wouldn't have as much to work with. So that's kind of how that went. And that's the digital world. Now I want to move over to the live world. I'm coming for you next, Alan. But I want to talk about the live world. To photograph someone as uh, prolific and as, uh, I guess he doesn't really never sat still. How, how do you capture someone like Prince? And what is the pressures like back in those days? Uh, I'm, I'm going to give this to Greg first. Yeah. Greg, yeah. talk to me a little bit about uh, photographing Prince live and what the pressures were and what you were looking for, how you worked together, would he give you a nod once in a while or would he be uh, elusive? How does that all work? And how did that all work? Uh, just what you said <coughs> is exactly what it was like. You had to pay attention. Uh, you never really wanted to sit and kind of doodle. You had to get your settings right and follow him constantly because he would he would give you a nod. He'd give you, he'd give you an angle. I'm sure Jim would say the same thing. So it, it was always, uh, uh, 
if he was going to give you a, a facial expression, you're going to be paying attention. It was, it was tense, I thought, always for the draft team live, or any time, frankly, uh, because he just did not sit back and, and kind of relax. He, he, was, he was so on all the time. That's pretty much it. I mean, I, I, I thought it was a little, uh, tough, but I really enjoyed photographing him because he was the subject he couldn't miss with, ever. Right. And you never really knew what you were walking into. Either it was an uncontrolled yeah. environment, right? Absolutely. Jimmy, tell me how you handled that as well. I mean, everybody has their methods, but I'm curious to hear yours. Yeah, one of the toughest things to do in photographing any moving object, and in this case, a person, the greatest, maybe the greatest performer of all time, uh, well, it's tough to focus on a moving uh, object. So uh, one of the things that I figured out very early on uh, Prince would be up at the mic, as I am now, and I would focus, I always try to focus on the person's eyes. Uh, that's where I, and it's not easy, a little tiny human eyeball, but that's where I would start. And then, but then he's blocked by the microphone. Yeah. So sometimes I would adjust a little bit, knowing he's going to eventually move back, and I would wait for that moment. You'd anticipate that moment. Yep, and he'd back, click, click. And, um, so that was a little bit of the strategy. Uh, and, um, and I have a, some kind of a predilection to try and get a smiling picture of these artists. They're all, all the artists that I shot, uh, they're cool and they know they're cool and they don't give you a smile all that often. And in those early days of my career, a film was expensive and then you had to pay to have it processed and that was expensive. So I was very judicious on how many pictures I would take. So uh, I would have to make a 36 shot roll, maybe I'd bring just two of them. And I, a whole concert, I'd only shoot 72 pictures, wow. partly because of the cost of doing this uh, thing. Uh, so I had to pick my spots and anticipate the, either a smile or some you know, twirling movement, which of course was all the time or the splits or all the amazing things that he did, which as we know later in his career, some of those uh, athletic things he did uh, took a toll on his body, which is another issue and that was sad. Right. But um, hopefully that gives you some idea of, no, absolutely. of how I approach <coughs> him live. Yeah, oh, that's great. Al, I want to ask you a little bit about um, sure. the studio. You had a little time to set up. Oh, yeah. The iconic shots. Tell me a little bit about whose concept it was. No, it was always his concept, and then I had to bring Hold it that up. mic closer to you. It was like, you know, like when we shot Dirty Mind, uh, you know, I go, well, you know, Prince goes, I want to get shot on a bed. I go, oh, this is going to be my first album cover. I'm going to shoot a black man on a bed. And I, just, I, mean, I don't mean that to be prejudiced. I just, it's just well, that's what it was. And uh, so then I, I found a mattress. And um, stripped it all down and just so that's what spanned them in dirty mind. I had no idea that was a mattress, by the way. Yeah. Did you all know that? Yes. Okay, I'm new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then uh, the controversy said he wanted to be shot in paper. And the other thing I could think of was a parakeet. <laughs> and I'm going, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> My brother said, do controversy daily and put a song on there, but we didn't. We did do the controversy daily, but he he just had headlines like Joni for Joni Mitchell, and you know, um, gun on passes or something like that. And so he wanted to like do all these headlines and just you know, like you know my head got so small, so I said you just got to pick out four that work, and we'll do that. But we spent the whole night doing that. I think in 36, oh man, <laughs> we're doing two and a quarter, and we did two bricks. We did 40 rolls. It's like a two and a quarter is just something. Oh yeah, two and a quarter is two and a quarter inches. Six by six. Yeah, six by six. It's a giant uh, negative. Giant wow. negative. And you only get a few exposures per roll. Yeah, and then um, I built the set that was night and day, because I was his personality at Gemini, where, you know, he's, I had one side of the set where it was day and one side where the moon was coming out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he hated that. He said, no, I'm not going to shoot with that. 
<laughs> so they let me shoot one roll. Yeah, it was very unusual. But uh, but yeah, we did get you know back in the day where we had to process film and we had to pay the lab for all the film, all the processing. And I actually painted one picture of Prince. That was a black and white shot from a from a music video, and uh, <coughs> and he just grabbed it out of my hands. It was rolling so the next day. I don't know how he worked it, but he could get stuff done really fast. Right. And all my stuff was in record stores. Like when we go to Houston, Texas, and all my stuff was in the front of record stores. I'm going, this is stupid. Well, he loved what you did, obviously. Yeah, I mean, and, and we loved and, what you did, and so did the record stores. Yeah. So that was weird. Um, I, because I was just doing local artists before right. Prince, and doing a lot of fashion, and uh, I didn't. I would never dream that I'm, I'm, I'm making a career out of music. But then, music was really big in the '80s. So we had Target and we had Music Land, and so everybody would come through town. So Billy Joel, Tina Turner, Cher. I'm like, I met all those people, Maya Twain, um, you name it, I, I shot them. And, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Let me, just because I know that we're already at the half hour mark, I want to talk, right? I mean, I think, I think we are. And I do want to be good for, with your time to leave it for some Q&A, but I do want to talk a little bit about something that's, I know I'm curious about. What is it like to collaborate with someone like Prince on that level? Mm. I mean, is he directing traffic all the time? I'm going to bring it over here to you, Steve. When you worked with him, and you may have a different answer, each one of you, uh, on how this worked, uh, were you tell, giving him concepts, or was he was he uh, giving you all the ideas? And How did that work? How, what's the collaboration look like? I don't even know what that looks like. I guess, I mean, for us, it was kind of a collaborative only because I wasn't just doing the photography. I mean, that came later. I'd done all this other stuff where he just let me go. Like with the Glam Slam video set, he's like, you know, I want you to do this. And I went off and did a quick drawing for him and he approved it and then I went and painted it, you know. And uh, Graffiti Bridge, I had already done that painting um, and he loved it, but he needed me to add some things to it. So there were things where I was kind of on top of that. Other things where he'd come up with concepts. With the photography in particular, it was collaborative in the sense that he'd say, like I said, grab the camera, and it was sort of we rolled through things, and even to the point where, um, I know I've said this before, so you guys kind of know this, but like when we did the Mill City music uh, posters, while we're doing that shoot, he asked me, he said, why do people think I had a nose job? I said, well, <laughs> and of course you're like, does he want the answer or not? <laughs> you know, like, what is he actually, is he actually asking it? And I said to him, I said, well, do you want to know? And he goes, yeah, and I said, well, when you started off, a lot of the earlier covers I saw of you, you look very directly at the camera. So the camera's like coming right here and it reads the ball in his nose, mostly. Later on, he started to get that whole looking out from under the eyebrows with the sexy eyes thing. And what it did was it shifted his nose down and it just read differently. That's all it was. And he said, really? I said, yeah. He goes, let's take some pictures like that. So if you look at the Mill City Music Festival uh, poster that he, he posed for, it, it is dead on. And you look at it, and that's what it looks like. It looks like the old days photos, because that's how he tended to shoot back then. So that's just one example of how kind of like weird little collaborative things come up that you wouldn't think about, because he asked me a question, and I answered it. So it, it went back and forth, I feel like. I mean, he had the ultimate yes or no on things, of course. Of course. But I, I know you and I have worked together for 30 years. Well, so I know the way you work. And you'll see something. You'll see a location. You'll see a chair. You'll see a some metal or something, a cool location, and you'll go, we're gonna shoot here. I mean, was it the same way of working with him? Um, I, I feel like he, well, the fact that he lived here all the time, and I only came in, you know, occasionally, he drove that a little bit more. I mean, the Arboretum, for example, which, you know, a lot of people say are their uh, favorite shots of him that I took, um, he was very much like, hey, 
hop in the car. <laughs> I'm like, okay, get your camera, let's hop in the car. And he drove us out there. You know, now I would look for things in the background, like, oh, hey, there's this cool little house over here, stand over there. Hey, let's have you sit on the park bench <coughs> because that seemed weird. Like, you know, you're sitting on a park bench. Um, so there was, so again, I had some input on it, but I mean, he definitely was driving the original idea. So, and that was just a location thing, I think. Like, if he came to where I lived, I'd probably be the one saying, like, hey, here's a cool place. Right. And for you, Greg, shooting, you shot uh, live. Primarily. Primarily live, right? Yeah. Did he ever, did he ever, did he ever, after working with them for a while, come, come up to you and go, you know, I like the way you shoot me in this particular light or this particular fashion? Um, what, what was the collaboration? What did that look like from a live perspective? Or did he just say, go for it? No, he pretty much just let you do the fact that you get thrown out. <laughs> it was a pretty good indication that he was going to let you right. do what you were you know, trying to do. Because Chip, his bodyguard, would always be in the background. He would just wait for that tap to get that guy. Um, and he never did that. He, he's always let me keep shooting. Uh, and I just did it in a fashion where I was never too overt, to being a pain in the neck, that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, so in that respect, he, he would uh, allow you to do it. Um, off stage, when he did other things that were off stage and events, yeah. he, he would he would be kind of more more relaxed and he'd smile a bit and things like that. And you had to again uh, just be ready to get the shot because it, that's it, that's all he'd give you is just what he you know was in and out and let it go at that. I think. Yeah. Hell, you were with him for well, five yeah. years or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, forever. Um, Talk to me about that collaboration because I, I gotta tell you, Prince really, really, really rode me. I um, when we first did live stuff, I was a studio cat and I said to him, I said, I don't do live stuff. He goes, Yes, you do. You'll still figure it out. Well, I go, Thanks. So, so the whole first roll I did was all black because I didn't know how to set my camera up. Oh. And the next time we went to was Atlanta, and this guy from Atlanta showed me how to set up my camera. And then I'd show everybody else in the pit what this guy showed me. And uh, so, yeah, it, it was easy then after that. But but he was tough on me. He was, he would make me get up in the morning, go have breakfast, get the film process, be with him at 1 o'clock, do sound check at 3 o'clock, shoot that, and then do the evening show, which... As you know, he'd make everybody wait, yeah. and uh, he'd be a two-hour guy. And uh, he'd just be out there, and uh, yeah, it, it was strange. And, um, uh, <coughs> you know, working like that day after day gets you, you know, it just, because I asked Nancy Bunt, I go, well, how many times do you talk to Prince there in the Proprietor? And she goes, three times, maybe. And you know, with me, it was every day, right. every single day. Right. <laughs> hey, Jimmy. Yeah. And in, 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 when you were shooting Fritz, um, he pretty much let you go as well, right? That's true. Yeah, I didn't have, uh, you know, uh, sessions right. uh, with him. Uh, but of course, living in Minneapolis as I did, and uh, uh, and we're the same age. Born in the same year in the same hospital. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so I would hang out at a lot of places he'd hang out. I'd be at First Avenue uh, on the dance floor with a, a date, and Prince is right next to me dancing. I mean, it was it was kind of a cool time, and um, and uh, you know he he would recognize me, give me a nod, and, but it was basically unspoken. Oh yeah, that's that photographer guy who's always shooting me. Uh, but I didn't have the kind of relationship that uh, Alan, for God's sakes, had, which is, um, yeah. you know, amazing. And oh, I know. Seems. And Alan, you, like, played guitar with him, you hung out yeah, with him. Yeah, we played You guitar. were in the studio with him. I was in the studio with him. I said, what do you start with? You know, you play all these instruments. I go, you know, what do you start with? He goes, you play the drums first. I didn't know that. I mean, you know. But he had a foot switch. He's at the record plant in LA. He would play the drums and uh, hit the foot switch, and the machine would stop because he'd fire all the guys that came to be in here. Be? We know. So, uh, <laughs> you know, he had a lot of control. And, uh, 
Um, I was just there to watch him. And, uh, and then we jammed together, and he played drums for a little bit, and he played keyboard for a little bit, great keyboard, and great bass. And then at some point he'd come over and go, I gotta play guitar, I'm sorry. So yeah, he'd yeah, yeah. kick me out. <laughs> and that's the only thing I could play. And I couldn't play like him. I mean, he was circling around me. It was like going out and playing in an NBA game and you're out of the high school or something. Right. You know, I mean, it's like, man, that's how good you gotta be to be a, a great guitar player. So I knew that. I, well, I better keep this guitar stuff up. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not friends. Yeah. Okay, good. and this is, we're gonna end it up here, but I know that you were at Paisley a lot and he would bring, ask you to come into the studio once in a while, and you, you'd actually give him some opinion. Yeah. <laughs> How'd that go? Uh, I mean, it went, uh, as you'd expect. Um, so, the, so I found out, by the way, after, after I left, um, some of the engineers told me, he said, you know, you were the only person, practically, that he would bring in on a regular basis in the studio. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah. And so I figured it out. Like, if he was happy with what I was doing, he knew I was into music. We would listen to music together. He would bring me down as kind of a reward, I guess. I didn't think about it, but he'd, come, he'd call me in, and I'd be like, he was in the middle of recording a guitar track, and he'd tell me to come in, you know, through the little glass door. I'd come in, and he'd start talking to me while he's laying the track down, and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, like, oh my God. So, you know, and, and yeah, so that was really cool to, to find that out. And uh, one time, uh, I was in there, and he asked me about something. He's like, what do you think? And I... <laughs> I don't know why I told him, but I did. And um, uh, his wife at the time, Manuel, was in there. She told me this story. Um, she reminded me of this story. And um, so apparently, and he kind of looked at me like, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. He kind of gave me one of those. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to leave now. And I go back upstairs, and she said, you know what happened after you left? I said, what? He goes, he did what she said. I was like, really? I was like, okay, okay. Last question. Favorite moment that you had with Prince? I'm going to start with you, Jimmy. Oh, okay, well this uh, actually uh, relates to my mom, who's in the audience with us today. Hi, Mom. So... Hi, Mom. 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 <laughs> so, uh, one day I drive my mom to Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport to drop her off, I think she's going to California. Um, who pulls up right behind us? Prince and his little BMW. And... He, he was dropping somebody off, or maybe someone was dropping him off, I don't exactly recall. But you know, we all remember what his car looked like. I mean, how many uh, black BMWs with dark windows were there in the Twin Cities at that time? It was, obviously, it was him. So, uh, mom got out of the car, went to get on an airplane, and I just like sat there and wondered, what should I do? Should I go knock on his window? Should I wave back? Should I just leave? And uh, went over and knocked on his window. It comes down like this much. He just gave me that, that side eye. And I went back to my car a little frightened. That was it. That was it. That's it. I, I let him know I was there. And oh, that's anyway, awesome. that's a fun little memory. Al, what's your favorite moment uh, photographing Prince? Well, I, I got so many. I mean, we'd be here all day. Give me one. Um, the only thing that, that, that he made me do that was really hard was I had to bring my whole studio out to his house to shoot controversy cover because he didn't want to go anywhere. So I had to bring all his stuff. So I brought stands, umbrellas, heads. And, I, and you know, all he wanted to shoot was the ring light. You know, if you would have just told me that, <laughs> I could have just brought the ring light and shot. And he would have, he would have been fine. And no, I brought like four heads, five heads, three packs. Um, well, you know what it's like. Uh, and, so, and so probably, you know. I had a camera and lens. Camera and lens. That's probably the way to go. No, I was preparing for the, you know, I didn't know what his house looked like at that time. But yeah. That's, that was a favorite moment? That's the favorite moment. What yeah. about you, Greg? Give me your favorite moment shooting first. Um, but well, it actually wouldn't be shooting it. It'd be, it was after the Capri concert. I okay. got a call. And I met him over at Penny Willie's house. It was like freezing cold January night. And he parked a, a small Cadillac out in the middle of the road with the engine running. 
came in, sat down, and he bought a set of the photos for me to pre print. Just, you know, for his own personal use, whatever, to have around, put in the files, I guess. And I, he, I was kind of amazed because I'm trying to talk to him about stuff in general. He just sat there, didn't say much of anything, and then he'd answer brief questions. And he whipped out a checkbook thing, which I had never seen before. It's five levels of checks. Been a business checkbook thing. Oh, I was which I got mail. Yeah. So he wrote me out a check, and I'm like an idiot, I cashed. Uh, because back then, it's like you said about film and processing cameras and everything, you needed money. So you, you cashed it, and later on, I went, what was I thinking? But nonetheless, we were just talking to him, and he was like people described quiet, um, somewhat shy, but, uh, but I, I took that away as a very special evening. A bit of an idiot with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. Steve, your favorite moment? Um, it was so. It was my favorite moment because it was like the most surreal moment. I think um, I was doing a cover photo for Notorious Magazine with him, and they sent out the art director from there, and the first person to allow me to set up a photo shoot the right way, which was really cool. And uh, we used a shower curtain from Target as a, as a filter <laughs> uh, for the light. <laughs> so Prince comes in and he wants to have. Um, you guys are going to know better than I think he said, it said free. Yeah, that was what it was. Okay, he wanted the words free on his stomach in gold paint, right? And so the art director guy, he's mixed up this gold paint he, he got, this acrylic paint, and he's walking over to Prince, and, he, and Prince looks at me and he goes, he's going to do it. And I'm trying to set up the shoot, and I'm like, well, I'm going to do what? And so, sure enough, I'm dipping my finger into this gold paint, and it's laying on the green of his stomach. It is, it is like six in the morning. It is cold in the soundstage, and Prince is laughing every time I touch him. <laughs> that that has got. I, I don't know how you can beat that. Right. Uh, well, let me just say one more time to each one of you. Um, my personal thanks, and I guess I speak on behalf of all of you as well, for capturing. Um, Prince, it's so incredibly and beautifully, and you created and helped him create the persona that he was and and is and ever shall be with this book and and all that you have done on your own personal level. We thank you for your incredible artistry. You guys are amazing. Let's hear it. Questions from the audience? Is that okay? Shout them out because we're all deaf and old. <laughs> I'll speak for myself. Don't be shy. Come on now. I saw him, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> There's the favorite moment. We have a question right here with the gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, Steve, you were talking about like the uh, Mill City poster and uh, um, there's some pictures if you go in Paisley of Kabidi, the purple guitar that he's got in front of him. And you can see it's like pixelated along the strings going at like a diagonal angle. How did the uh, like early digital cameras you're talking about, you're capturing this, you know, icon. How did you make sure you got a quality capture? How do you maintain quality? Like, it's not about the technical stuff. There is a lot of post-processing to fix those files. Um, frankly, the um, the way that it, it grabbed the image, there was a lot of noise in the um, blue and red channels. So you had to do a process where you took it over to lab color, which nobody even knows what lab color is, and I didn't either. The black channel was great, but the red and the blue had a lot of noise. You had to like kind of blur it a little bit, but you, if you blurred it too far, you got what happened on the cover of Minnesota Monthly, where Prince looks like he got smudged. Because um, I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, this is all new to me. Um, so just over time, you had to figure out methods to make it better. I'm, I'm actually going back to a lot of my images. I've got a bunch that nobody's ever seen. And doing exactly that. I'm having to take as much technology as I can to make them look as good as they can. On top of that, I'm putting in, weirdly enough, I'm putting in fake film grain to make it feel more correct. You know what I mean? Like to the eye. Because that, that stuff back then was what we were talking about earlier. It's, it's the, uh, Greg and I were talking about this. It's like the only th word I could come up with was crunchy. Like it just felt not smooth. And it was one of the limitations of what it was. So you worked around the limitations and, and being a, a painter previously, it's not like I want to try and like do that. I didn't want to paint on top of it, but I want to figure out ways to get it as clean and as uh, appealing 
as it could be. So really, it was just trial and error because nobody, nobody, I didn't have anybody to talk to. Nobody told me how to do it. I just had to figure it out, you know, that was it. Do you think a lot of that's in the source or is it in the processing, you know, someone making a poster? Um, I think, right. so I, it was in the source because the, um, it, it was just the way those things were built. They, they were built for very specific things. If we never shot ever the proper way, it should have, they should have had strobes. They should have had strobes. And the first time I tried <laughs> strobes, I'd never shot with strobes before. All I cared about was getting a good exposure. Prince looked at it and was basically like, oh, this is, this is boring because it was. It was just flat light. So he said, let's work with this 10K light. It was a 10K movie light, one 10K movie light with no filter whatsoever. I dragged it about halfway down the uh, sound stage. He was at one end, and it was like halfway down because it was so bright, it would just blow his face out. Um, so yeah, it was just the limitations. That stuff was meant to be used a certain way. He didn't care. And I had to figure out on the back end how to make it look good. Another question? Yes, ma'am. The question is, what's your favorite shower picture shower. that you ever taken? Yeah. The shower shot. Or, I'm sorry. The shower shot. The shower shot. The shower shot. My favorite picture that I did in this book is probably uh, the picture I shot of him at Bunkers. Um, and uh, I think I was the only photographer there that night. Um, there might have been one other. But, uh, you know, that was unusual to be able to photograph Prince in such a small a venue, and I think that was just like a guest appearance, and it was very close. So that's my opinion. Um, I'd say probably the one where he's got his arm outstretched and his eyes, one of his eyes is just piercing. It's it's a flaming shot where he's out of back like, like this. Uh, it was a live shot, and to this day, I still like that one probably the best. It's in the book. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what's in there. <laughs> to be honest. Um, is the sun is, the, is the, the fall photo of him with his eyes closed in that book? I can't remember. Do you guys remember that? There, there's, ooh, that's a nice one. I like that one, actually, to be honest. And all these fall ones, I, I really, I just love the feel of all those. So pretty much, when anybody asks me, I mean, I really do like those because of the because of the vibe of them. So I'd say, at least right now, that's that's my favorite one. Did we get yours, Al? Yeah. yeah. Shower, 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 shower. Got it, got it. I can't hear anything. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, oh, go ahead. Um, what's your favorite that another photographer took? Ooh, what's your favorite <laughs> shot that another, the other photographer took? <laughs> I, I, I was unknown to me. I was a huge fan of Alan's work as a teenager. I didn't know who did it. Because back then, it was hard to find out sometimes who did it. Even though you had album credits, sometimes you just you didn't know who did what. And for the longest time, I was so angry that I didn't get to go to the show where the poster was sold where Matt Fink is being, he's on a leash. <laughs> I, but I'd see, I saw it later, like in life. I was like, oh, that's so cool. I never saw that. I didn't, I didn't, it was obviously a show I never went to. So seeing that in this book was awesome. You know, I mean, it's just such a fun, ridiculous, right, just crazy. And I loved it. It, it. it was like everything about this band at that time, it was right there which I thought was awesome, just that they were just, we're gonna do whatever we want, we don't care, we really don't care. And I, I loved it, I mean, but I, frankly, I, I have to say, I'm a lawyer, so I, I'm a little biased, to be honest, because because I, I got to see some of your stuff up front, and I was just like, ah, oh, I love these pictures, so, you know. But I really, to be fair, I have been impressed by everybody in this book. I mean, people I didn't even know who they were, I didn't know you guys personally, and I looked at your work, and I'm like, this is astounding. And, um, you know, so, it's, I'll probably change my mind every, every time I'm looking. Do you, do any one of you want to share or? Uh... Uh, about a month ago, I was in New York City visiting a very old friend of mine who's in this book, Robert Whitman. And uh, I, I still really do like that picture that he did in front of uh, Schmidt Music, I think it was. Um, and uh, so that comes to mind. Okay. Yeah, I'd have to say the same thing, but those the series of shots he did, um, Schmidt Music and then the other other shots that are in the book that he that are you know like studio stuff, but they're just clean, crisp shots. I love them. Oh, Robert was a good photographer. Robert and I hung out when Sheiks was a dance club, not a strip club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a dance club, and actually, um, Prince lost his license, 
So we went together in my van. So he, he called me and said, pick me up, we'll, we'll go clubbing. So first we went to First Avenue and then we went to Sheik's after. And uh, we split up. I said, you need to go do your thing, man. And then, uh, and I saw this really pretty girl. And, I, and she's like sitting in these pews and I'd like to like slide in like, uh, you know, across from her and I go, you know, I photograph all the stuff for Prince. And she goes, no, you don't. I know who does, and I ain't you. <laughs> I went, whoa, OK. So yeah, she shut me down. So I never used that line again. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Question over here. I have a question for Al. Yeah. Would you ever consider doing a book with your pictures, your old photos of the time? Sure. No, I want to do that next. I want to do time, manage sex. So yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah. 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 Um, I think uh, I think the time was more exciting because there there were so many people to focus on. You could focus on Morris or Jelly Bean or or Jesse Johnson or Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis or Lonnie Moore. Um, but with Prince, it was a spotlight. It was just on him. So, it, it, and in concert, it was as Kitty wanted. As far as, you know, I thought the time, like, kicked ass. It really yeah. kicked ass. Hey, before, before, we're going to have one more question, but I just want to recognize somebody else who was in the house, who is a Minnesota music legend. And I can't go without recognizing my big brother. Jelly Bean Johnson is in the house. Thank you for all your contributions to this music. And we, we love you and we enjoy all accolades. Oh, I have to say that, man. You can't go without, you gotta give it up. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. What would you say is the biggest lesson you learned from working with or alongside Prince? Whether it's a life lesson or Biggest life working, working lesson learned. Prince, uh -huh. Well, you just know you never get you're never gonna get your way. I mean, you're always gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's his way or the highway. Um, that's that's the truest fact. And uh, oh, yeah. go ahead, Jimmy. Uh, I guess uh, the lesson I learned is. Uh, you can express a lot by saying very little. Uh, just respect, period. And you? Uh, mine was basically to, if, as long as he didn't say anything to you, keep doing what you were doing. That was, and, and that has actually paid well for me in other, in other mediums. Uh, just keep doing it, unless somebody says, don't do it. Let's give it up for these panelists. Go off it a little bit or rephrase things or whatever.